Some of you have complained that the VOD is only held once every four weeks. So I'm certainly very gratified by that uh, complaint, but I wanted to explain that the off-the-cuff style of delivery that I have may be a little bit deceiving. It really takes me a full four weeks to prepare each VOD. So there really wouldn't be time for me to have Vada more often than that, so I wanted to explain that. Now, um, getting to tonight's VOD, we've all had the experience of coming into a retail store and seeing on the cash register a dollar bill scotch tape to the cash register, or sometimes right behind the proprietor on the wall there's one or two dollar bills. Well, the first time I saw that myself, I was very perplexed and I thought to myself, what is this, a spare change in case he doesn't have enough in the cash register? He's gonna reach on the wall and pull it off the scotch. It didn't make sense to me. And I asked somebody many years ago and they explained to me that this was the first dollar that he made in the store and he's proud of it. So he puts it up on the scotch tape, on the wall or on the cash register that's the very first dollar he, he made in the store. So I wanted to say that by way of introduction, that there's a couple that I saw 45 years ago. And I'm gonna tell you details about this couple and you're gonna wonder how in the world could he remember a couple he saw 45 years ago? And the answer is, this was the very first couple that I ever treated. And I don't have them scotch taped in my cash register. But I remember them very, very well because it sticks out in my mind because uh, it was the very first couple I'd ever worked with. It was a very uh, friendly couple, very personable, very easy to speak with, and uh, they probably didn't realize how anxious I was when I first met with them, but they put me at ease right away. And when I was asking them what was it that they were coming for, what was the problem? The husband said that he kind of sensed that the last uh, year or two, they're married for a few years, not that many. They had about three children at the time, young children. He felt that she was a little bit distant from him and he wasn't sure why. And he tried to discuss it with her and she couldn't pinpoint it either, but he felt that there was a certain distance between them. It bothered him and he was very open to the idea of counseling and he wanted to see what could be done. So we started meeting, started talking to them about their relationship, getting to know more details about the couple, about the family. And I saw them for a few times and they really seemed to be very personable, friendly, very nice people. I enjoyed meeting with them, but I couldn't figure out what the problem was. And then I got a phone call from the wife after one session, and she said, tell me, uh, would she be able to meet with me privately without the husband there? I said, well, I don't know about that. Uh, first time anyone ever asked me that because it was, it was the first couple I ever worked with. So I said, I have to think about it, but um, uh, I, I would feel uncomfortable doing that behind your husband's back. Would you be willing to bring that up at the next session, and if he's okay with it, I'm okay with it. So she said, all right, she'd be willing to do that. So the next session, she said, at the end of the session, could she meet with me privately without the husband? I turned to the husband and I said, how did he feel about that? He said, look, it's okay with him if she wants to discuss something with me, if, if, uh, if it's all right with me, it's all right with him, and that's fine. So I had a session with her alone. When I met with her alone, she could practically couldn't contain herself. She broke down in tears and she told me that she was keeping a secret from her husband. And he didn't know about it. And before we go any further, you're not gonna know about it either. But she shared this secret with me. But this much I will tell you about the secret was that it bothered her so much that she was keeping this, withholding this from her husband, that she had discussed this with a, a Poisic. And the rub she went to said there was no question in his mind that it was completely mutter for her to withhold this information from her husband, and he even recommended it. 
So she had nothing to worry about. And even though the Pesach had told her that she was 100% within her rights not to share this with her husband, she still felt guilty. And the guilt was bothering her. And she realized that's what her husband is sensing. There's a certain distance now created by this secret. And uh, she didn't know what to do. So I said, well, look, once she shared the secret with me, I said, I can't speak for your husband, but he certainly seems like a very reasonable fellow. And over the time that we've met, he seemed to be very understanding. And, and, and I really think, even though it's mutta for you to keep this from him, that it would be in both of your best interests if you shared it with him. I, I, again, I can't guarantee his reaction, but I would encourage you to do it. I said, you know what? Maybe you want to do it instead of at home. If you want, you can do it in my office next time you come. And, and maybe in, in the environment here that, uh, that's more safe, perhaps, and you feel more comfortable, maybe it will work out well. She said, well, she'll think about it. Well, at the next session, I asked if anything, either one of them wanted to bring up, and she mentioned that uh, there was something on her mind she had discussed with me, and she shared the secret with her husband. And as I predicted, the husband was very accepting, very understanding, and he was very grateful to me that I had encouraged his wife to share the secret with me, to his wife for sharing the secret with him. And I didn't need to see them very much more after that. And this impasse that they seemed to have had was cleared up once the secret was out of the bag, so to speak, and they were able to communicate openly about this matter. Now, if we want to look in the Torah for an example of the first time there's an issue of a secret between a husband and wife, we find in the and Pashas told us that there are secrets between Rivka and Yitzhak. Now, before we discuss anything about the Avos and Imos, it's very important to be makdim that we cannot approach even to the level of the toenails of the Avos and Imos, Imos to understand their greatness. Nevertheless, the Torah describes them in human terms. And as great as they were, the Torah uses language and descriptions that make them sound very human. And if the Torah does that, it's to teach us lessons that we can learn to apply to our own lives. So let's see, what does the Torah say about the relationship between Rivka and Yitzhak? We see that Rivka kept three secrets from Yitzhak. The first was that she understood very clearly who Esav was, and that's why she loved Yaakov. The Torah says that Yitzhak loved Esav. But Rivka understood Kitzayed Befiv, that when he asks, how do you mice or salt, he was just faking. He wasn't really so from but he was trying to appear that way, and Rivka saw through it. Nevertheless, we don't see anywhere in the Torah that Rivka tried to enlighten Yitzhak about what she understood regarding Esav. And this was one secret that she kept. The second secret was the, the bigger one in the Parshas told us, is how she conspired together with Yaakov to have Yaakov masquerade as Esav in order to get the brachas from Yitzhak. This was clearly a secret that she kept from Yitzhak and didn't tell Yitzhak that she was planning this at all. This is all behind his back, together with Yaakov. And the third secret was that when Rivka heard, the word got back to her, that Esav is planning to kill Yaakov, and she was terrified that something should happen to Yaakov, so she told Yaakov to run away, and when she mentioned it to Yitzhak, she didn't mention a word about Asa's plans to kill his brother. All she says was, Katsti I don't want my son to marry any of the local girls here, and 
Yitzhak told Yaakov to go to Padanaram, to his, his mother's family, to find a wife, but she never mentioned anything about Esav wanting to kill Yaakov. So three times, Rabosai, we see that there are secrets that Rivka keeps from Yitzhak. We also see that they had a very, very different relationship, Rivka and Yitzhak, from the other Avos and Imos. We see by Sarah and Avram, for example, Yaakov and Rachel, they spoke directly with each other. There was, seemed to be a Kaviyachal, a closer relationship. They even argued with each other. You don't see that with Yitzhak and Rivka. They had a different relationship, a more distant relationship. Now this was clearly necessary in order for the Hashkacha to come about that Yaakov should get the brachas in the way that he did. And this was part of the Hashem's plan that Yaakov should get the brachas in the way that he did. And in order to do that, it was necessary for him to have this type of relationship. Now, before we organize a demonstration in front of my Lakewood office, where does Mayor Wickler come off to say this? Sounds heretical to describe the Avos and Imos this way. It's not coming from Mili B. This is really something that the A. McDover describes. And in order not to take my word for it, I'm going to read that section of A. McDover where he describes this. It's actually in Parshas Chayasara, the end of Parshas Chayasara, where we read that when Yitzhak, when Rivka saw Yitzhak for the first time, she either slid off the camel or got down off the camel, according to some shot, the more she fell off the camel, but she got off the camel, and she said, who is this? And Eliezer says, that's Yitzhak, the man who's going to be your husband, and she took a, a veil and covered her face. And this is what the, the Nitziv writes on that posuk. Why did she cover her face? Because of a tremendous anxiety, a fear, ubusha, and shame. Kamosha mevina, as if she understood that it wasn't fit for her to have such a husband and such a madrega, such a person like Yitzhak. And from then on, writes the Nitziv, Nikva Baliba Pachat Mimenu. She had a fear of Yitzhak from then on, and it remained. She didn't have a relationship with Yitzhak like Sarah had with Avram. Barachel and Yaakov, or Rachel and Yaakov, where we see Asher Beyos Lahem Eza Kepeta Alehem, where there was some disagreement between them. Oshini Deya, they had a, a different way of looking at things. Lo Boshu Ladover Ladaber Reses Lefnehem. They weren't ashamed to speak in an angry way in front of their husbands. Mashain came Rivka, which we don't see by Rivka. And all of this, Hikdima la Sipur, was brought earlier to the story. Shiyabu Bapashas told us that it should, it should come before the Parshas told us. Shahi Yitzhak for Rivka Mukhulak and Bedeos. Yitzhak and Rivka had different opinions. We call Makom, Lo Matza Rivka Lev Lahamid. As Yitzhak al Nevertheless, we don't see that Rivka tried to convince Yitzhak of her point of view. Bidvarm no chachim, in a direct, close conversation. Kihi yodas ha'emes, because she understood the truth. Ki Esav rak tzayed befiv. Esav was just a faker. V'chein b'shas ha'brachas, and also regarding the brachas, eventually given to Yaakov. This whole relationship was dafka minashemayim. She agiu ha brachas liYaakov dafka dafka beosu haofen. The brachas had to come to Yaakov dafka in this way. That's why they had to have that kind of relationship. Because she yavur b'mokom atam adovah. 
And if Rivka had a relationship with her husband, like Sarah and Rachel had with their husbands, it couldn't have happened this way. The story could not have taken place this way. This all was from the beginning, at the time that Rivka was first frightened by Yitzhak. The Yitzhak Akris Dover Kafiritsono, and the end of the matter came out according to the will of a Kodesh Baruch. And what we see from this parsha of, of Rivka and Yitzhak is that the distance that they had in their relationship was necessary in order for these secrets to come about and these secrets to be kept because that was part of the Hashkacha Pratis of how the brachas had to come to Yaakov Avinu. We see here a relationship between secrets and a distant relationship. The connection. In the case that I started with, we also see the reverse, that when a secret is kept, it causes a distance. Here, in, regarding the Rivka and Yitzhak, there was the distant relationship was necessary in order to allow the secrets to be kept and held and not shared. But when it comes to relationships between husbands and wives, sometimes people feel that there's nothing wrong with keeping secrets I don't have to share everything with my spouse. and There's nothing wrong with that. But we see there's a connection between keeping secrets and distance in a relationship. And when secrets are shared, it has the effect of bringing the couple closer together. And I want to share one final example to illustrate that point. There's a couple that I was working with more recently than 45 years ago. So I also remember that case, but not because it was my first. A couple came to see me for marriage counseling, and I asked them what was the issue, what do they want help with. And the wife said she feels her husband is too critical. He's just, he's just so mockpit on everything, it's causing tension at home. And I turned to the husband and I asked him, well, what does he have to say about it? And this was very unusual, it kind of shocked me. He said, it's true. I am too critical. Well, that was kind of unusual when a couple comes to see me and one spouse complains about the other, the other one's usually defensive. It's is that true? You're the one who's critical. I'm not the critical one. It's all your fault. And back and forth, that's usually what you have. But it's very unusual that a couple would come, one spouse would complain about the other, and they would say, yeah, it's true. I said, you... Acknowledge that you're too critical? Yes, I know what the problem. I try to work on it, but uh, would you want to learn to be less critical? He said, yes, I would love to. I said, well, in order to do that, you'd have to be working in individual therapy, not marital therapy, because that's a personal issue, not between you and your wife. If you're acknowledging that you have this, this issue, you want to deal with it, then that's something for individual therapy. He said, okay, then you're the therapist. If you feel I need to be seen individually, work me individually. And I asked the wife, well, that means I won't be able to see you? She said, look, I originally came for marriage counseling, but if you could help my husband become less critical, then I don't think I would need any marriage counseling. I think that would really help matters tremendously. So I said, okay. And I started working with the husband individually. Well, I didn't see him for too long until it became rather obvious why he was so critical. Because he had been raised by uh, a, a mother who was much more critical than he was. And it's understandable where this came from as well as his mother was a, uh, was a child of Holocaust survivors. And uh, I don't know that much about the grandparents, but I know that uh, what the husband told me that his uh, he feels his grandparents also had this issue, uh, perhaps as a result of the war or before, I don't know, but his own mother was 
raised in a very uh, authoritarian, strict household, which was very harsh conditions, and she adopted the same attitude, and it came to the third generation. And I asked him if he had ever worked with anyone on his difficult childhood. He hadn't, if he wanted to try to finally deal with the, the demons from his past, and he said he certainly did. And we began working on helping him to, to overcome the, the traumas he had growing up in this very difficult household where his mother had been so, so uh, harsh with him in raising him. And uh, at one point, he mentioned to me that um, when he was getting more in touch with his experiences growing up, and describing to me the details of, of what he went through and how, how hard it was on him and uh, how embarrassed he was at times, uh, the way his, his mother would deal with him in public and uh, how much he, he hated going home and loved being in yeshiva when he was in the dormitory and being away from home was his greatest pleasure that he wouldn't have to deal with, with all this at home. And it clearly had a very significant impact on him, and I was working with him to help him deal with his past and deal with his demons and, and work through the trauma that he had growing up. And he said to me that uh, he had never mentioned any of this, what he talked about with me, to his wife. She didn't know anything about this. He completely covered it over, normal childhood, regular parents, and she didn't know anything different. She doesn't understand why he was so critical and why he was, was making things so tense at home. But uh, she was clueless about it, and he thought he was going to share this with her. And I said, well, I think it would be very helpful for her to know where this is coming from, that it's not just a, a defect in your, in your genetic makeup or in your DNA, but there's a result of difficult experiences you've had that you're working on, and you're trying to overcome it. So he did, and he shared it with his wife. And she was terribly relieved to hear that. There was a reason, there was a method to the madness, there was an un understandable cause why her husband was acting this way. And he was finally dealing with it and opening up to someone about it and working on it in his individual therapy. And just the fact that he shared it with her made her feel that now he was trusting her with this information. He'd been married a few years and he never mentioned anything about it. Quite a few years, never mentioned anything about it. And now that the, the quote-unquote secret was out and she was able to discuss this with her husband, she felt tremendously hopeful. And the husband told me a couple of weeks later that he saw a dramatic change in his relationship with his wife they were closer with each other, and he attributed it in large part to the fact that he had shared the secret he was keeping with her from her the whole marriage. Now, the, the takeaway from the Vod tonight is, Rabosai, that we all have secrets, sometimes things we don't want our spouses to know, and sometimes things that we feel we have to keep from them. And there may be sometimes that it is necessary and is helpful. But one of the consequences of keeping secrets from your spouse or your spouse keeping secrets from you is that it does create a distance and the secret itself can create a certain tension in the home because you're always trying to cover yourself and make sure you don't slip and let something out. And it, it creates a, a distance in the relationship that at times can be very unhelpful and unhealthy. And if it's possible, I'm not saying it always is, each case has to be taken on its own merits and each situation is different. But if it's possible to share the secret with your spouse or encourage your spouse to share the secret with you, it can go a very long way towards bringing the two of you closer together, which is the ultimate goal of every marriage for husband and wife to get closer to each other. I just want to mention that the uh, next VAD will not be next month. We're going to be off of Benazmanim, and we'll be meeting in, in eight weeks, not four. 
which comes out to be uh, in Elul, the Sunday night, September 10th. Bezos Hashem will meet here at our new venue in uh, Sterling Place uh, downstairs. I wish you all a gesunden uh, Zummer and uh, healthy uh, Benesmanum. Thank mm-hmm. you.